who will be announcing something that uh, did not necessarily come out of uh, the media briefing. So that is why the two ministers are here to announce on issues that relate to their own areas of work. And uh, I will go through what uh, I usually do on Thursdays after a cabinet, uh, a cabinet meeting, the post-cabinet briefing. We will then take very few questions because we still have to go back to, to the cabinet Lakotla, which has not ended. So any really um, inquiry that would arise out of the post-cabinet briefing, we will arrange for the various ministers again to be the ones that come in and give uh, added information on issues that might arise. But we will take very, very few questions because we really have to go back. Thank you very much. We met on, on Tuesday, the 1st of August, 2017, and we also met again this morning as, as cabinet, but in between the Lekhotla uh, took effect as well. Uh, South Africa commemorates Women's Month in August and is a tribute to more than the 20,000 women who marched to the Union buildings on the 9th of August, 1956, in protest against the extension of past laws to women. The National Women's Day celebration will take place at Khalishiwa Stadium in Kimberley in the Northern Cape. Cabinet approved the theme for this year's celebrations as the year of O.R. Tambo. I wish SABC could do its work before we start. The year of O.R. Tambo, women united in moving South Africa forward. Cabinet calls on South Africans to use the month of August to celebrate the role of women in our society. Cabinet was briefed on the three-month program to be rolled out by the Moral Regeneration Movement. The MRM is mandated to facilitate encourage and coordinate the program that seeks to restore the moral fiber of our society. This movement seeks to revive the spirit of Ubuntu, Butu, using various government and civil society resources. Cabinet approved the three-year operational program of the MRM and uh, the phased approach of mainstreaming the moral regeneration program within government. Cabinet further approved that South Africa submits its bid to the 2023 Rugby World Cup. This will once again afford South Africa an opportunity to showcase the, to the country, to showcase the country to the international community. South Africa has previously hosted world-class events such as the All Africa Games, the Cricket World Cup, the 2010 FIFA World Cup, and many other conferences, symposia, and, uh, and meetings. As the country, we have learned that these past experiences, particularly the cost overruns and collusion, which accompanied 2010. It is a, it is a, as a result of this, government refused to sign an open-ended blank check, which led to a South Africa withdrawing its bid to host the Commonwealth Games. Cabinet was apprised on the spin-offs from such an event. South Africa already has the requisite infrastructure to host the tournament without allocating a budget for infrastructure development. Sports is said to be one of the most effective drivers of nation building, and the rugby sports program would enhance this cohesion. The program to be rolled out throughout the country leading to 2023 will leave a lasting legacy for the development of rugby in underprivileged communities. Cabinet has approved the overall proposed package for this tournament, which is an economic bid, which would minimize the demands on the fiscus as well as stimulate economic activity employment, and empowerment. The tournament will contribute to stimulating our, our economy by supporting government priorities, especially as it relates to preferential procurement and adherence to sports transformation charter and the sharing of profits derived. The event will further boost our tourism and hospitality sector. Cabinet approved the establishment of the inter interministerial committee on World Rugby Cup 2023. The IMC will direct the bidding process for the World Cup uh, 2023 and ensure the country benefits economically from this event. The Minister of Sports, Arts, Minister of Sports and Recreation, Mr. Tulas Nisi, will, host, will hold a separate briefing to unpack this bidding process. That will happen after the post-cabinet briefing, and that is why uh, Minister Nisi is here with us. Cabinet approved the intellectual property policy of South Africa, phase one in 2017 for the publication in the Government Gazette for public comments. This responds to the National Development Plan's call for greater emphasis on innovation, improved productivity, more intense pursuit of knowledge economy, and better exploitation of the comparative and competitive advantages that South Africa holds. 
The IP policy is an important policy instrument in promoting innovation, technology, research and development, creative expression, consumer protection, industrial development, and more broadly, economic growth. Cabinet approved the draft green transport strategy to be published for public comment. This strategy will form the cornerstone of policy development within the transport sector regarding the lowering of the GHG emissions. The aim of this strategy is to minimize the adverse impact of uh, transport on the environment while addressing current and future transport demands based on sustainable development principles. The transport systems form the back of South Africa's economic activity by enabling the movement of people and goods. However, emissions from the transport sector amount to 10.8% of, to of the country's total greenhouse emissions, with road transport being responsible for 91.2% of these uh, emissions. South Africa has pledged a GHG emissions reduction target of 34% by 2020 and 42% by 2025. And this contribute, contributes to South Africa being a responsible global citizen. Cabinet approved that the Department of Home Affairs can reopen the reapplication process for the current Zimbabwe special permit holders under certain uh, conditions. The initial special dispensation for Zimbabwe was approved in, 20, in 2009 to document Zimbabwe nationals who were in South Africa illegally. Their permits expire on the 31st of December 2017. The Minister of Home Affairs, Professor Nkize, will hold a separate briefing to explain the conditions and the process to be followed once the reapplication process opens. Cabinet approved the South African Mint Company's designs for 2012 commemorative color coins series of flowers and birds of the Western Cape Coast Biosphere Reserve. This is an addition to the commemorative and circulation coin ranges to be issued in 2017. Cabinet approved the publication of the Deeds Registries Amendment Bill of 2017 for public comment it amends the Deed Registries Act 1937 so as to improve the, and enhance application and the implementation of the Act. The bill will also streamline and enhance administration and registration of deeds. Cabinet expressed condolences to the family of two soccer fans who lost their lives during the stampede. The President has constituted a ministerial committee of inquiry to investigate the circumstances that led to this tragedy and Minister Nessie will speak at length on that one. On appointments, all appointments are subject to the verification of qualifications and the relevant clearances. The cabinet has concurred with the recommended uh, candidate to be appointed um, in, in, well, well um, sorry. Okay. Mr. Lifense Kaitzen Radikeledi reappointed as national treasury representative to the board of the Export Credit Insurance Corporation of South Africa. The extension of the term of office of Ms. Tavang Charlotte Christine Mampane as the commissioner of the National Lotteries Commission. Professor uh, Nebutanda reappointed as chairperson of the National Lotteries Commission. Ms. Fadila Eten Lagadin as member of the Arts and Culture National Heritage, National Historical, Na Natural, Cultural, and Architectural Heritage Distribution Agency of the Board of uh, the N NLC. Mr. Sunrise Vusumu Zimkize as Director General of the Department of Arts and Culture. Ms. Tata Tatagathe Jordan Gyani as Deputy DG, ICT International Affairs and Trade at the Department of Telecommunications and Postal Services. The reappointment and appointment of non-executive directors to the boards of the Development Bank of Southern Africa for a period of three years or until 31st July 2020. That is uh, Ms. Anurada Singh, it's a reappointment, Ms. Gugum Tetwa, another reappointment, Professor Mark Swilling, another reappointment, Ms. Zanele Monakutla, an appointment of the first appointment, Ms. Lufuno Mutsarani, Mr. Lufuno Mutsarani, Ms. Bule Lwanda Mase, Ms. Pinkin Kaito, Ms. Litlohonolo uh, Meko, Mr. Blessing 
Mudavanu, appointment and reappointment of non-executive directors to the PIC, the Public Investment Corporation, for a period for, of three years. That is Mr. Tolani H. Mukwana, Dr. Tolani H. Mkwanazi. Uh, this is uh, as, as deputy chairperson. Ms. Matugana Mukoka, Ms. Dudutla Chwayo on as a reappointment. Ms. Sibusisiwe N. Gubane, also a reappointment. And Mr. Truman Goba, who is also a reappointment. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I think at this point I'll invite uh, Minister Mkwane Moshabane. Thank you. Honorable Minister, uh, and uh, colleague, colleagues, um, DCIS, we're here to share the news with South Africans that Mr. Stephen Malcolm McGowan a South African national who was kidnapped in November 2011 in Timbuktu, Mali, by Al-Qaeda militants whilst on holiday, has been kept in captivity since then. The family, the government, and all the people of South Africa and the international community have since been campaigning for his release. We are happy to announce that finally these efforts have culminated in Mr. Magon's release on the 29th July 2017. Would like to uh, warmly welcome him back home and wish him good health, good fortune in his life <coughs> as a free man. It is with sadness though that his dear mother, who I've met during this very difficult journey we've traveled with other members of the family, Beverly passed on in May 2017 without seeing her son back home. The government once again extends its deepens, deepest condolences to Stephen and his family as we did when this uh, tragedy befell us. May his soul rest in eternal peace. The South African government would like to convey its deepest gratitude to all role players such as ourselves, meaning South Africans, in campaigning for Stephen's release, the government of Mali and the people of Mali, the broader ECOWAS, the regional community of West Africa, the African Union, NGOs, and all individuals throughout the international uh, community for their efforts that eventually secured McGowan's release. Finally, we call on all South Africans to continue to support Stephen whilst allowing him space and time he needs in the spirit of Ubuntu to adjust to his environment after years of incarceration. I thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much, Ministers. Uh, colleagues, may I request that we confine our questions to Minister Maite and Minister Zozo, because immediately after they've left, there will be a fuller briefing with Minister Nwesi. So I will take questions for the two ministers. Uh, I think let me start with Karen at the back, and then I'll come with you. Uh, what is it? Yes, it's Apple, and then it's you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Karen Morn from ENCA. Minister, I don't know, are you able to give us any details of what um, precipitated Mr. McGowan's release? Was there any kind of 
hostage or ransom paid because we know that that one at one stage that was the demand. Um, and just t in terms of him psychologically at this point, how is he managing? Um, is there going to be any attempt to to provide counselling to him? And do we have any time frames for when he is expected to return to South Africa? Thank you. Thank you, Tsepo. Um, I'm Tsepo Ikanin from the SABC. Uh, Minister Jojo, has there been any kind of a clear-cut uh, directives from cabinet with regard to the two recommendations made by the ANC Lekotla about free tertiary education and the impending truce within the mining sector uh, with regard to the current uh, fallout between Minister of uh, Mineral Resources and the mining sector? And who may think one of two important developments happening in Africa uh, this weekend and next week, the elections in Rwanda and Kenya. Is there any message that South Africa wants to convey? Thank you. Thank you. And then the last one, Ms. Lulay. Good afternoon. I'm Kalang Bata from Bloomberg News. Um, Minister Slozlo, did uh, Cabinet discuss uh, the recommendations or even receive recommendations for the appointment of a new CEO at SAA? Thank you. I think we'll allow those questions uh, to be answered by the ministers. Thank you. Then we'll come to Cape Town before we release the two ministers. Well, um, on uh, the release of uh, uh, Stephen back home in South Africa, we just want to reiterate that uh, South African government does not subscribe to payment of ransoms. So even in this regard, that's why I focused on the work we have been doing in the past six years, campaigning, engaging with governments and with the, with the captors the way we know how. That's what we have been doing and that's what we can confirm. You see, receiving the necessary support, the, uh, the requisite for any South African citizen who had gone through this very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, painful experience? The answer is yes. Is he home? As I had appealed that we allow him space to just settle, the answer is yes, but can we please allow him to resettle and regain his freedom? On elections, that would be taking place starting tomorrow in Rwanda uh, from Tepo and uh, in the next coming few days in Kenya. All we can do is that we know that Africans now believe in peace, security, and development, subscribe through the AU um, statutes on principles of free, fair, and credible elections, and that's what we expect of our fellow members. The observers of the AU are on the ground doing what they do best during the time of elections. This is the route we have chosen, and which will reassure us that we will silence the gun in some few areas where we still find this uh, stubbornness by 2020 in line with the uh, aspirations, the seven aspirations which are in line with Agenda 2063. I thank you. Thank you, Minister. You will remember that uh, the Lekhutla started after the cabinet meeting and it broke this morning and we had another cabinet meeting to look at uh, cabinet um, memos that were, memoranda that were presented this morning. Um, we had to break again because the Lekhutla was to resume at 10 o'clock because the premiers and representative from Salga had already arrived. We had given ourselves an hour to deal with the new memoranda that were being presented uh, to cabinet. So that process has not ended. So I am not at liberty to 
give you any more information about what was discussed this morning in cabinet because that process has, uh, has not ended. Now, on the other questions that you had raised on tertiary, free tertiary education and also on the, the relationship between uh, the Department of Mineral Resources and the private sector on, on, the, on the charter that has just been uh, released, I am also not at liberty to discuss that today because the Lekhodla only ends today. So once that process has, uh, has ended, I then will be able to give you information on that. But what I'm trying to do here is the normal that we usually have on Thursdays after a cabinet, just give you highlights of what was discussed, agreed upon, and approved by cabinet. But uh, coming out of the Lukutla, we will then have another press briefing so that we take you through the discussions and uh, deliberations and approvals or whatever decisions that would have been taken there. So I hope you will be patient with me. That will, will be brought to your, to your doorstep. Thank you. Minister, I think at this point I'll only allow Cape Town and then we can release the ministers. Is there any question from Cape Town? Yes, it is. Wendell? Yep. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, 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 to the uh, uh, International Relations Minister. Um, Minister, just two things, please. I, I didn't get the date. When was uh, McGowan released? When did he uh, come to South Africa or arrive here? And if you could please just clarify, um, if, besides South Africa's great uh, endeavor, uh, did was there any other foreign country, maybe the French or anybody else? Uh, I think Gift of the Givers were involved. Um, besides your guys' negotiations, anybody else on your on your team, basically, um, maybe the French government or an NGO, something like that, please. And finally, if you can just give uh, one line on his um, uh, his actual what do you call it? His his his, his well-being. His uh, he's got all his limbs and stuff, you know, he's, he's, he's still walking or, or what? He, he looks very thin or he, he doesn't remember where he is. So something like that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. second question, and then there will be a third, and that will be the last. Okay. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, my name is Baba Londenza from the Sunday Times. Just on the draft green transport strategy that is to be published, um, look, I obviously haven't read it, but could you just tell us how um, I see South Africa has pledged a reduction target of 34% by 2020 and 42% by 2025. How does government actually envisage doing this? Is it what reduction of diesel emissions or diesel vehicles? Um, I know the city of Cape Town at some point um, had an issue with diesel emissions specifically that caused all the smog here in the city of Cape Town. Um, what exactly will you be targeting? Uh, there's also the informal taxi sector, which is also um, you know, public transport. I mean, how do you plan on yeah, dealing with it? Thank you, please. Last question, Linda. Good morning, Minister Linda Insoff from Business Day. Um, even though um, the country won't need to invest in new infrastructure for the Rugby World Cup, there surely must be other costs involved and um, has there been an estimate like marketing or, you know, security and any estimate of what those costs are going to be? And yeah, th that's it from Cape Town. Thank you very much. Before I hand over to the minister, Linda, can you withhold that question and you will pose it to the minister of sports once the, the briefing takes, uh, takes place immediately after this? Thank you. Sorry, so Pumla. Pumla. Yes. Sorry, it's Amo here in Joburg. I just was following up on my question on SAA, the appointment of the CEO. Okay. Thanks. I think on the question of CEO, C, the SAA CEO, I did say that cabinet had to break to allow a process that we had embarked upon of the Lukutla to continue. Once that is done, the decisions that were supposed to have been taken on the memos that have been presented this morning will then resume. Um, on the, oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> let, let me just retreat once again that on the um, matter of uh, our uh, fellow South African, Mr. Stephen McGowan, he was released on the 29th July 2017. Does he still have all his... Uh, limbs and uh, physical conditions, doctors are taking care of that. And I had appealed to our spirit of Ubuntu. Working, yes, 
Is he, is he, does he still have his full limbs? Yes. But uh, medical check, it's the normal routine that gets done when a person had, had gone through such a painful experience. And we had appealed, and I want to once again appeal to our, to our South Africanness, Ubuntu, that we give him the dignity he deserves. We give him a warm welcome back home, particularly that he lands home with a mother that has passed on during his incarceration. Which other role players were there? I had mentioned in the statement that the South African government, in collaboration and in cooperation with the Malian government, with ECOWAS, with the African Union, with the international community, we abhor this kind of activities of any sort of Al-Qaeda, of Daesh, of ISIS, or any criminality acts that goes into kidnapping innocent citizens. Remember, he was just a tourist in Timbuktu. So we had an international effort on this matter, and we are happy that he is a free man. And I do not have to retreat on the other things that I have uh, already alluded to. Safe to say, can we please give him the support he deserves from all of us? as his loved ones and family also deserve space to just take a breath and welcome him home the way they know how. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Um, on, on the strategy on green emissions, there are a few things that government would be looking at, but also there is a role that needs to be played by communities, our citizens, but also including the private sector one of which is ensuring that we create efficiencies and reliability of rail freight services, which means that the strategy should work at ensuring that the rail, fre rail freight is more attractive than road transportation, which will help in the reduction of, uh, of emissions. The second one is about promoting cleaner technologies um, the other is about promoting a non-motorized transport system and to develop infrastructure that is associated with that. We're also looking at uh, the promotion of green sustainable mobility and the uptake of cleaner and more efficient uh, technologies. And also to note that the strategy in itself intends to reduce air pollution, air, air pollution uh, from the sector's combustion of liquid uh, fossil fuels by creating an alternative to the fuel industry. So there will be a lot of work with regards to inviting even from the public innovative ways of assisting in reducing these emissions from the transport sector, but also ensuring that we in government through our science and technology um, um, entities, including the CSIR, we work at ensuring that we find alternatives that I've spoken about in the, in the non-motorized uh, transport systems. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We've just come to the end of this portion. So if we could just break for just two minutes whilst we allow the ministers to depart and the uh, minister and, I see, I think uh, and as, the team. As we break, Pumla, could we have the deputy minister for sports joining us here and also, and, and the DG as well, but also to remind you that today we sit in a newly named media center that was named after our revolutionary icon in communications, Ronnie Mamwepa. Can we also have the president of Saru joining us as well? And the CEO, if there'll be enough space Uh, 
Good morning once again. I hope we ready. SABC, you ready? <laughs> Okay. Um, colleagues, I'm just going to introduce the panel. Um, on my right hand side, I've got the, de the president of RAPI, Mr. Mark Alexander. Mark Alexander, sorry. The next two is uh, the DG, uh, Mr. Moreau. Get it right. Is the president of RAPI, Mr. Mark Alexander. The CEO of the Rabi, yes. which is Mr. Yuri, uh, Yuri Ru. And then I have the DG of Sports and Recreation, Mr. Alex Muremi. And we've got the Minister of Communication, Minister Ayanda Lodlo, and Minister of Sports and Recreation, Minister Tulas Mwesu, and the Deputy Minister of Sports and Recreation, uh, Mr. Her Minister, Deputy Minister Hart Gorstjason. And it's over to you, Minister. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Punga. Uh, Minister Jojo and Deputy <coughs> Minister um, Osteizen and the President and CEO of RAP and DG. The, there are two issues we just want to talk about. The first one is the establishment of the Ministerial Committee of Inquiry investigating the facts and the events that, that led to the death and the injury of the spectators at a soccer match between Orlando Pirates and Kaiser Chiefs on the 29th of July. And the second issue is to allow the media to, to ask questions in relation to the announcement which uh, Minister George has made about the Rugby World Cup. On the first issue, we, we have been given the permission by the president to establish this inquiry. Um, you would know uh, that uh, before the kickoff of the Soweto Derby between Orlando Pirates and Kaiser Chiefs on Saturday um, at FNB, that was the 29th of July, two soccer fans died and two soccer fans were critically injured and at least a number, that time the count was 19 uh, other fans, including a child, suffered uh, minor injuries. And uh, as a result of that unfortunate incident which happened, we are now finalizing the appointment of, of that ministerial committee. And it became so prudent that in terms of the law, 
uh, we are able to do that. And uh, we are also seeking guidance. We have made our submissions to the Minister of Justice because we need to appoint a retired judge and, and, and only two members in terms of the regulations. And those are the regulations in terms of the Public Finance uh, Management Act who would do that particular investigation. And even the terms of reference, we've um, finalized them, but they're uh, subject to approval of those by the Department of Justice and them giving us um, the, the name of the judge who would lead that. And um, once all that is done, we think that we'll be ready for the announcement either tomorrow or during the weekend uh, where we would announce that in, in, in full. But we just want to assure South Africans we are on top of the matter. We have consulted with the PSL because they are also doing the gathering of their own information and putting their own internal inquiry. However, as government, we will not just rely on, on that. Ours, we have indicated that the judge was to, was to be appointed uh, must be able to deliver that report to the ministry not later than uh, a end of the a month, not later than one month. We're just giving it a month from the date on which the committee will be officially established. So that, that is the first one. Um, so details we might be able on the terms of reference to give you uh, once once um, justice has been able to clear that. The second one relates to um, the, the big news, very big positive news. Uh, Minister, Minister Jojo has already announced that um, Rabi South Africa, that is South African Rabi Union, has had to put its bid, but it needed support from the government. And this was a long process. Some of you might remember that Minister Mbalula, my predecessor, had taken measures to ban Rabi and other three codes from competing or from bidding for international events until they had met certain targets. Rabi was included in that. Fortunately, at the time of the transition, a report by an eminent persons group uh, who were independent experts was presented to us. We studied that report, which was able to show that Saru had been able to meet its own targets of transformation. But we put a condition that we will continue assessing them on an annual basis on further targets which must be put because we believe that transformation is a process, it's not an event. On the basis of that, we had to lift the ban. Even them, they started very late to put the bid together. They did that, it needed our support, and that was approved by the government. And I won't repeat what uh, Minister Jojo has announced. What government has seen, has seen this particular bid as, as an economic bid an economic bid which has been based on the projections which have been done by professional companies to look at what is there for us. By the way, we must emphasize, we have learned from the 2010 World Cup, various mistakes which were committed, where we ended up with a lot of uh, money which had to be paid after the tournament. And we have put 
very stringent conditions and all that must be followed in relation to, to, to this, this World, World Cup. Um, but uh, remember that it's just a bit. It's not yet in the pocket. A lot of work still has to be done. We are going to be putting an IMC interministerial committee, which will be working with SARU, putting the different stakeholders um, in, in, in <clears throat> on board in terms of all the processes. And uh, we hope that, therefore, we, we would be able to qualify. And we have said one of our strengths as South Africa in this bit, we're beating with two other countries, France and Ireland. And we believe that already as South Africa, we do have the infrastructure and the expertise. And of course, a proven track record of running such complex events. We've had a number of international activities here. And you know, one of the requirements is eight stadia who can be able um, to host such events. South Africa, we even have more than 10 of such stadia. And we think that on the infrastructure, we are spot on. And remember, remember that that's where the biggest, what other people call the waste, but that's where the biggest spend was, which led even to collusion. And uh, you know that Minister Patel, economic development, is dealing with those issues where there was a lot of collusion uh, in terms of the construction of the stadia. This time around, that big spend is not there. The stadia are ready, they've become an investment. And lastly, we believe that we have the millions of South Africans who are behind, who are behind us to host the, 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 the World Cup. And um, issues of the challenges of transformation, we have been able to, to put them very clearly to sorrow that they must be uh, taken on board. But transformation here, we're talking about development of rugby at the lower levels. In the national teams, you can see, we do have black and white faces who are doing very well. So that's all I can say. The reason why we've brought uh, the president and the CEO of SARU, if there are any technical questions, they are here to answer, in particular, um, the CEO and, and our DG of Sports and Recreation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Linda, you were the first one <coughs> with your question. Yes, thank you very much, Minister. Just to find out, there must be some budget required for security and a whole host of associated things besides infrastructure. Any estimate of, of the likely cost? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question from Cape Town before I yeah. come to yes. Joe Pretori? Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Um, uh, further to um, uh, uh, my colleague Linda's question, it um, uh, does the cabinet statement does speak about um, uh, an overall proposed package for the tournament. Uh, so, if you could just flesh that out, please. What is the overall package? Uh, why is it going to minimise the demands on the fiscus, and how is it going to stimulate economic activity, uh, specifically regarding to job? job creation uh, uh, and empowerment. If you can just give me those figures, please, thanks, bye. Thank That's you. That's it from Cape Town. I'm here in Pretoria. Is there any other question? Yes, uh, Alexi. Good morning, Minister Anton Mayer from Pretoria FM. Minister, you call this uh, an economic bid. Um, you don't sound too excited about this bid for the 2023 Rugby World Cup if you call it just an economic bid. Um, is this enough to convince uh, IRB that we are the nation that they want to host the Rugby World Cup at? Uh, calling it an economic bid won't be doing it for me. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Minister Lachelle from ANN7. Uh, firstly, to the minister, you talked about there should be consequences if uh, Saru doesn't 
um, stick to the uh, transformation plan between now and 2023, should they fail? What are those consequences? If you can share that with us. And to the CEO, um, there w there's talk in the statement about uh, there will be programs uh, in disadvantaged communities. How different will these be to what we already see, where it's just not a case of a three-day uh, rugby clinic? Are we talking about centers, specific academies? Are we talking about coaches within that area coming in? What are we, how different are these programs compared to the programs that are currently running right now? Thank you. That's all, ministers. Uh, those are the questions. I will allow the minister Bobo, followed by the DG and you, and come at the end. Can I just answer the last the question that you had asked? I'm sorry, I did not get your name. Uh, when, I, when I announced this, I specifically said that Cabinet has approved South Africa to submit its bid to host the 2023 Rugby World Cup. And, I want, and then I said, this once again affords South Africa an opportunity to showcase the country to the international community. I then went on to speak about how sports is seen as a catalyst for social cohesion. So latching on to one part of a whole statement that has been made takes away the essence of what it is that we're talking about. So the issue is economic, but it is not only economic. It deals with a whole host of things that you would want to see happening as we go through this process of bidding right up until the day that we fold and give a report on what has happened and how good this, uh, this, uh, the holding of this, these tournaments would have been. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The question about cost uh, of this. We, we, have, we are requesting cabinet to underwrite a tournament hosting fee of 2.8 billion rents or 160 million British pounds. Uh, in today's current exchange will be about 2.8 billion rents. Uh, this uh, amount uh, is for us to buy essentially the rights to host uh, the tournament uh, from World Rugby. And uh, essentially, in previous World Cups, we have also requested Cabinet to also underwrite uh, the operational budget as well as the capital expenditure budget. With the Minister already having indicated the availability of Stadia, and if you consider that they were finished just before 2010, uh, in 2009 early, many of them. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I have flu, so I hope. Uh, uh, but essentially, essentially the key issue would be that uh, the stadiums will still be quite new uh, from a stadium point of view by 2023. And uh, they need to be utilized. They can't just be white elephants. And mega events uh, mean that we're able to utilize the stadia for that purpose. And the reason we say it will not put additional demands on the fiscus is primarily because with this bid, we are confident that should we get the rights, we would uh, be able to make a lot of money <coughs> out of it for rugby and uh, for smaller sporting codes uh, as well and for government itself. And to that extent, we aren't asking the National Fiscal or Cabinet to underwrite the operational budget because that we would raise with SARU uh, via a private <coughs> bank uh, to finance that and we would be able to pay it back and uh, still manage to make money out of it. We, we say this is an economic bid primarily because we believe that uh, with the previous Previous bids, we, we allowed, uh, particularly with the 2010 uh, Soccer World Cup, we, our intention was one, to unite the nation and to uh, have a social cohesion program as a main, but importantly, we wanted to leave a lasting legacy. And I think this is what is often forgotten, that we pitched that World Cup as a World Cup to build legacy. And that legacy is the stadia and the infrastructure you see. And that infrastructure today is saving us well to be able to uh, make money out of uh, the tournaments that we now host because we now have the infrastructure in place. 
the, on the question of the consequences uh, if transformation targets are not met, I think the minister has before him a number of instruments uh, listed in the National Sport and Recreation Act, which he may pursue uh, should the targets not be met. One of them is the one of the ban on bidding and hosting. Uh, that's the first one. But the second one is on the funding that we provide uh, to the National Sports Federation, such as SARU. Uh, we understand that uh, perhaps in the case of SARU, that's not so important because what we give them constitute about 1.3% of, of their annual budget. So it's, it's, it's really neither here nor there. But essentially, there are other things they require from us. One of them is the what we call the political premium, uh, for instance, uh, on the support, whether the sponsors should endorse uh, the activities and so on. We, we no longer give that cheaply and quite freely. And uh, that may be one of the biggest things and instruments we have. But also importantly, the other important instrument in our arsenal uh, is the whole issue of recognition. Uh, if needs be, we may withdraw recognition of SARU as a recognized sport board, uh, which then essentially means that their operations in the sporting sector will become quite suspect and uh, cagey. The last thing we have is the national colors. Uh, if there is non-compliance, we may withdraw the colors uh, to the national teams, and which means essentially the teams may be fielded by SARU, but they will not be South African teams they would be perhaps a SARU team, uh, but it will not be a South, South Africa. They only become South Africa once the minister allocates those colors and they then play as, as South Africa on behalf of the country uh, as such. So those are the consequences and the instruments we have at our disposal. Pumla, could I just get Linda. some clarity quickly? Linda, Linda can, we, can we finish responding and then we'll come back if you still need clarity. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, DG. Thank you, the ministers. Um, in terms of, of uh, probably the last answer, um, we are in the fortunate position that uh, we don't really need to sort over our heads in terms of transformation. We as an organization believe in transformation. We have set our own targets and uh, we are less stressed about those targets and on the consequences of not reaching those targets in the years to come. More importantly, towards the positive news of today and the direction we're taking, we believe as a, as a, as a country we have a, a very competitive bid and we believe we've got a technically superior bid than everybody else. We base that on basically four tiers. First and foremost, um, we will be able to host probably one of the best World Cups ever because we have the legacy of the stadiums that was built in 2010. In terms of our budget and our budget approvals for the next couple of years, we do have contingency within those budgets to upgrade those stadiums and to uh, make sure that they kept up to standard in terms of their pitches. In actual fact, we will, we will take out all of the pitches and put new ones in for, for the Rugby World Cup, and that is already in the budget. In terms of the questions uh, around that, um, technical bit for, for the stadium. Uh, we've got all of the other infrastructure in terms of hotels. And in the actual fact, we believe in terms of our price parity compared to Europe, that we can provide the same hotels at a third of a price at uh, three times the size of the hotels of Europe. And any of you that have traveled to Europe will understand what I'm saying. So we can host any World Cup at a third of the price that the rest of the, the world can. So from an from economic point of view, that is, a, that is pretty, a pretty easy sell to world rugby. And then we're a, we're a sports-made country, and I think um, South Africa will afford this tournament the same it did for the, for the 2010, and will be rugby-focused for that period of time. The sales of tickets are at exactly the same price in, uh, in real terms that it would be in 2015, which makes it affordable for, for both South Africans and all of the rest of the world to be able to, to come within the range of that ticketing. And then we have probably what nobody else says, we are uniquely South African. In no other country in the world will you be able to swim on the beach in the one moment, watch a rugby game the next day, then go and watch animals somewhere, enjoy, enjoy the uniqueness of the Eastern Cape or any other of the cultural experiences of South Africa. So on those four pillars is we've got a really unique bid and I think we're competitive in what we do. When we talk about the security and the security cost, um, obviously within our budget, there's a pretty big amount allocated towards security uh, to the tune of 120 million. 
But like for any other normal event, uh, we are reliant on our local municipalities, we are reliant on our local police force and other forces to assist us on the day. But it's nothing new. It's going to happen Saturday when the Lions play the final against the Crusaders. It's happening every Saturday when any PSL match is taking place. So uh, we don't expect that that should be a hurdle in terms of, of where, we, where we're going. In terms of the broader budget of the, of the event, it is a 415 million um, pounds event. Um, that's a pretty hefty number of which the government has, has underwritten a, a fair amount. For the rest, that will come out of your sponsorship money, your broadcasting money, your ticketing money, and your, and your merchandising. So in, in that broader spectrum, uh, we, we're very confident that we will be able to deliver that budget and, and also make a profit. And in terms of that profit, we have a an, an, an deal with, with both government and then also with SASCOC and our smaller entities that the, the profit will be shared in terms of, of South African rugby, the government to relieve some of the funding that they've given us, and the rest of the funding will be made up in terms of direct taxes um, and the broader economic impact of, of the event to, to South Africa. And then obviously to the smaller unions that um, federations in the country that don't always have the ability to raise funds for their events, there will be an allocation to them. And then importantly, in terms of our bid, um, every bid that goes to World Rugby has to have a le legacy program, and uh, we are not there to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we're currently endorsing some pretty big programs that are based on sustainability, um, and not what uh, we refer to as a clinic, and we refer, refer to a clinic as a hot dog and coke show, where people get pulled together for a day, given a t-shirt, a hot dog and a coke, and you think you've done development on any phase. We don't operate in that way. We do that in a sustainable way through a program which is called Getting to Rugby, and that program is only tested on one base, whether it's still there in 12 months and whether it's increased in 12 months. And we will endorse that and some other uh, more physical projects and, and then obviously legacy projects in terms of um, stadia in, and, and bigger support. So overall, um, given the, the gracious support of, of government, um, we believe technically we have as strong a bid as France or Ireland. Thank you very much, Minister. Yeah. Look, I've said I've said uh, before that transformation is not an event. Thanks, Minister. I've said transformation is not an event, but it is a process. So to be direct, I said this World Cup will address a government priority, which is sports development and transformation. And we've engaged with SARU, and they have committed to meeting their obligations in terms of the sports transformation charter and to leaving the legacy of rugby in the countryside, in those underdeveloped or underprivileged communities. So that this tournament will, will leverage to support other government priorities around issues of, of, of empowerment, including the 30% set aside. I think Minister Joshua talked about that for the SMMEs and preferential procurement. <coughs> now that we, 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 SARU has met its annual obligation, it's not an end. We continue engaging, we continue assessing the progress as we do with all the sporting codes. And re-looking at their targets really looking at their programs. It's not the just current programs, it's even other programs which we're discussing as an add-on to the programs. And we therefore say, through our eminent persons group, which is an independent group of experts, they continuously, so it's a continuous assessment. They continuously, annually assess them. 
Well, good afternoon you with the Midday Report. I'm Alicia Jarland. Were you currently watching the media briefing of the post-cabinet Lekhotla by, of course, the different uh, interministerial constituencies? It is now time to take you to the North Gauteng High Court where former Intelligence Services Minister Mr. Ronnie Kastrils is currently testifying. These are the live visuals from there. Is that correct? Quite correct, absolutely. Okay. Continue. So, uh, Mr. Castro, there was an expectation that for some, perhaps even many, of uh, the recruits who might be arrested, interrogated and tortured, that there would be a breaking point. And there was an expectation that um, uh, detainees under torture might break and reveal information. Exactly. Was there an instruction, or perhaps I should say a doctrine or policy on the part of the South African Communist Party. Please. Yuri, don't go to GMB. Just wait for them. Take, take your seat. Take your seat. In case they would want one-on-one. On one. They do want one-on-one. On one. They want one-on-one. On one. This rugby team is a big story. Minister. Yes, my darling. Yeah. Yeah. 